uh, for our second part of our fake uh, night course in forgeries, frauds, and everything in between. Uh, we're delighted to have Fiona Newell, Professor of Experimental Psychology, and Nicola Marples, of, um, the, as, bleh, a Professor of Zoology, uh, both from Trinity College Dublin, uh, joining us this evening for an exciting and entertaining uh, talk looking at the human behaviour and animal behaviour and uh, the world of deception. Exploring how uh, keeping it real, apparently, in the animal kingdom is overrated. And uh, we're gonna, if you'd like to welcome them, and we'll give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so Nicola and I thought it would be fun to compare uh, how um, humans and animals use deception to get their way. And um, I'm a perception scientist, and I'm very interested in how, we, how the senses take in information and how the brain makes sense of that information. And as part of that uh, research, um, some of the things that I'm interested in is uh, how do we make judgments about other people's faces and things in the environment. And so without my background and Nicola's background in animal behavior, we thought it might be a nice, interesting exercise, even for both of us, uh, to compare how animals and uh, humans behave. So, no doubt, uh, you are well aware of the fact that humans are very good at deception and lying and cheating. Um, and, uh, and there's just, you can't pick up a newspaper uh, these days without the headlines telling us about how um, human, with the repertoire of behaviors that humans have in order to uh, dupe and deceive um, our fellow uh, persons. Um, and, but in my group, what I'm particularly interested in is, um, well, how do the senses make judgments about what is fake? So, for example, um, here on this slide, I'm showing you some images that we've used in an experiment with our human participants, where we ask them to judge or make dis um, uh, distinctions between images of fake food and images of real food. And what we were particularly interested in is how quickly can people make those judgments? And the second question that we were interested in is, where in the brain do those judgments um, arise? And what we've discovered is that uh, we can make judgments about what is fake and what is real very, very quickly, within about 40 milliseconds, which is very fast. And not only that, but uh, this picture of, the, of our results shown here from MRI scanner will show you that um, those decisions arise very early in information processing in the brain. Specifically, they can arise to visual images, at least, really early on in the visual cortex. Um, so, in other words, the brain is tuned to be able to tell something that's real from something that's fake. And we can learn from um, studies of animal behavior as to why we might have a brain that can make those types of um, decisions. Okay, so uh, in, in the animal kingdom, the uh, things aren't always what they seem either. And a predator, for instance, if it's looking for its prey, is going to have to very quickly um, work out where its prey are, is compared to the background that it's trying to hide on. So um, if you look at this uh, picture of some coral, eventually you'll work out that there's a little fish there pointing downwards, and he's managed to be very hard to see, not because he's all that um, hard to pick out from the background, but because he's not in a, an orientation you would expect for a fish. So being in a different direction is one of the tricks you can do to um, or the animal can do to make itself harder to find. You can also disguise yourself as something inedible. Um, and if you look at this um, uh, cricket um, that's pretending to be a leaf, um, you can just about, oh yeah, you can just about see the um, antennae. Um, my uh, helper up there is giving, she's pointing <laughs> out the antennae. You can see the antennae. If, you put those an if he were to put those antennae down, he would be very, very hard to pick out indeed. So um, uh, disguising, something, disguising yourself as something that's not food is a really good idea. Um, this is a, an animal that's even more um, fantastic at that. He's just all of uh, um, a leaf. But if you look on the extreme left-hand edge, you can see that there's, a, go to the left a bit. There, yep, that's his head with the eye just above and the antennae coming up the side. And then you can go along his back that looks like the mid rib of the leaf. And down the back here are his legs back legs, and then you can see some um, small legs at the, in the middle. So 
fantastically good at pretending to be something that you're not. You can also take the approach of just being impossible to spot. Um, this guy here um, is a little caterpillar, but he's lined up the line along his back with the midrib mid of the leaf, so he's almost impossible to spot, at, spot. And once you've worked that out, then you can work out the little fluffy bits down the side um, are ways of making himself look flat against the leaf. But it's really a caterpillar. Another approach is to just try to be terrifying, even though you're not. This is another type of caterpillar, perfectly normal little caterpillar when you see him um, when he's not being attacked. But as soon as he's attacked, he turns his back end into the head of a snake. Um, looks just like a snake uh, attacking the bird. And so the bird's going to think, uh, no way, I'm, I'm leaving this. I'm, I'm not, not risking that one. Predators are playing the same game. They're trying to hide um, from um, their, their prey so that they can get close to them or can lure them close to themselves. So this uh, snake is sneaking up on you. Um, can you put your hand up when you can spot the snake? <laughs> Some of you still can't. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's green, and um, if my helper at the back with the, with the uh, cursor can drive go along the side of the snake, if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Come, come past the middle, and you can find its head. That's the, that's the leg, the, um, the the back of the snake. Yeah, that's right. That's it. There's his eye. <laughs> <laughs> so um, predators play the game as well to try and just kind of sit there and hide, so that they can lure their um, prey towards themselves. Um, and this guy here is a um, anglerfish, and the little knob on the top of his head is actually something you can flick out and wave. Um, and um, other fish will just see that waving in the water. They'll think that it's a, another little fish, and they'll come down to try and eat it, and he'll open his massive mouth and eat them. Um, so, but he's really well disguised as a, um, that particular type of coral that he's sitting next to. This guy here is doing exactly the same game, um, but he's trying to be a piece of kind of seaweed-covered rock. Um, but you can just see in the middle um, uh, up a bit, up a bit, up a bit there, um, his little um, lure that he waves uh, to get fish to come close so that he can eat them. And my favourite one is the uh, red-lipped uh, red batfish, you can tell why it got called that, um, who has just that teeny little bit of white under his nose, um, and, but he lives in a very dark area, so that bit of white shines in the darkness, and if he just wiggles it a little bit, then the fish will come down and he can grab them. So predators and prey are both um, playing this game. So the question is, do humans have tricks in which they can lure somebody else into, let's say, a relationship, for example? Um, and of course we do. We um, are very interested in um, how attractive we look, and we are very interested in attracting a good mate. But um, many people will say, well, actually, attractiveness, what we find attractive is, is idiosyncratic. It's um, up to the individual. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. When, in fact, that's not actually the case at all. What we find attractive and the features that we find attractive in other humans tend to be universal. So there are lots of studies showing, for example, that there are certain features that are uh, preferred in faces, no matter what sex of the face, the race of the face, or the sexual orientation of the participant. We all find the same types of faces attractive, um, even if we're unfamiliar with those faces. And they're, un they're universal. These findings can be replicated in every um, country that you do the same study. And so here on the left, this uh, number of figures, if you just concentrate on the right-hand column, what it shows you here is the correlations between um, ratings of attractiveness to faces that were conducted with participants that were either a different race or a different sex or a different ethnic group, etc. And those correlations are really high. They're the kind of correlations that every scientist would love to get. So it tells us something really interesting about um, us as human beings. So what is it that we find attractive in other faces. There's a lot of research into this. People really want to know, uh, probably for themselves, but also um, just to understand the hum human, human beings a bit more. Um, we know, for example, that features that are associated with sexual dimorphism, so features that exaggerate your sex, um, are preferred. Uh, we know that youthfulness is preferred in faces. We like young-looking faces rather than older-looking faces. Um, familiarity has an effect on attractiveness. The more often you see something, the more you you're going to like it. 
Um, but an, a, a curious one is averageness, and that always surprises people because um, it turns out that we don't like things that are that unusual. We might be attracted towards them just for pure interest, but we prefer things that are typical or average. And that goes for faces, it goes for wristwatches, it goes for practically everything. It seems to be a cognitive rule that the brain likes um, things that are typical. Um, we like... There's some evidence to suggest that symmetry is something that we like, um, but it's not consistent. And a very simple way of illustrating why symmetry doesn't always work, especially for human faces, is because as soon as a face moves, symmetry is broken. Um, so, uh, it, so it's not something that applies generally, although you will find it in the animal kingdom that symmetry is a feature that is preferred. Um, and also there are other interesting biological, hormonal effects that drive our preferences for different types of faces. But just to go through these in a little bit more detail. So, for example, we do like, we have, we have a preference for faces that have youthful features, and that goes across the whole lifespan. And just taking babies, for example, everyone loves babies, right? But we prefer some type of baby faces over others. And in particular, we like babies with big eyes and high foreheads. Those are specific features that connote youthfulness, or neoteny, as it's called. So if you look at this computer graphics um, uh, image here um, of baby faces, the, the two faces in the middle of the image are the original photos of those faces. And what a computer algorithm has done has made the baby faces more or less cute by increasing the size of the eyes and, and lengthening the forehead. And in rating studies, then, what we, do, what we find is that the faces on the right are judged as being more cute than the faces in the middle or in the faces on the left. I think you probably agree with that as well, wouldn't you? Um, so we like big eyes, and Disney knows this, and it's known this without doing any science um, for years, and all of its characters, especially the princesses, have all got nice big um, eyes. Um, we can also, of course, um, exaggerate eye features, especially in females, to make our eyes look bigger. Um, and the question is then, the interesting question for scientists is, why do we like youthfulness? Um, and we think there's selection pressure that, uh, that encourages neoteny, um, and, but also, of course, in females, uh, uh, youth is associated with higher fertility, um, which is why we might have a preference uh, for it. But we also like youthful features, and it doesn't matter in what face we like those youthful features. So, for example, female faces are considered more youthful looking because they have bigger eyes than male faces. But if you feminize a male face, then female participants, uh, heterosexual female participants, prefer those faces of men that have been feminized than the original faces um, of the men. So we, we can use these uh, features as lures, the other um, complicated factor, though, is that there are biological um, factors that play um, and drive our preferences. So an interesting one is um, that our preferences change during the menstrual cycle. So um, during the cycle when conception is uh, highest at risk, we have a preference for men that look like men. So if we look at this guy here on the top right, we have a preference for uh, per the guy who um, is on the right hand uh, side of that image when conception is most at risk. Outside that period, outside those days then, um, women have a preference for more feminized male males. And the idea is that the, during conception, we're driven towards uh, being attracted to men who have uh, these sort of grisly features because uh, testosterone is related to genetic health. Um, but outside of that time, we might be more interested in luring a partner that is more likely to stick around and look after our offspring. Um, so you may or may not disagree with that. I'm not even going to tell you what I think about that theory, but um, that's the way it's been described. Um, testosterone itself, then, um, has been associated with preferences, uh, so, and, but specifically um, through dominance. So testosterone is associated with dominance in males. Um, you can measure how much testosterone you have um, by measuring the ratio of your ring finger to your index um, finger, like shown um, up here. Um, and it turns out that the more testosterone you are, the more you're perceived as being dominant. And dominance, dominance in itself, then, is related to attractiveness, but it's also related to other types of decisions that humans make. For example, selecting uh, leaders, in uh, political leaders, um, as well as other types of um, decisions. 
So, um, so biological factors are interesting to, under, to understand the role that they play in perceiving the effect of, of different lures in attracting um, a partner or in making decisions about uh, pol political leaders. But as, uh, as Nicola said earlier on, things aren't always as they seem, and humans know that, and we can uh, contrive the way that we look. Um, humans are not always as they seem. We can enhance those features that we know are um, attractive. Um, I'm giving you some examples here. Um, and uh, um, and they're, they're, you can consider these as being very much parallel with the type of animal behavior that Nicola has just discussed in some ways. Um, but also, um, we can use disguises as well uh, for our own intents and purposes. Um, and uh, because I'm interested in face perception, I'm also interested in understanding whether or not um, our ability to recognize other people is affected by disguise. And it turns out that uh, if the face is unfamiliar to you in the first place, as soon as it changes its disguise, so for example, as soon as that person puts on a hat or glasses, etc., our ability to recognize that person declines. Not if that person is familiar. Of course, if your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter puts on a hat, of course you're going to recognize them still, uh, even if they put on glasses. Um, but the task of recognizing unfamiliar others becomes even more difficult if they're all wearing the same disguise. So if everybody wears the same disguise to a party, you, you're really unlikely to remember um, any individual um, the following day. But that can be purposeful um, in, uh, um, for us. So for example, if we think about the role of uniforms or disguises that are homogenous, like in this image up here, the purpose of that is to take away the identity of the individual because that individual is now representing an authority or a, um, an establishment. So in some ways, the, uh, the, although they may look a little bit silly, um, but there's actually an actual purpose behind this, that these people are repre representing the law. They're not representing themselves. They're not meant to be recognized as individuals. They're there to be, re to be representing a law. Um, and the same goes for any type of uniform that goes, whether it's uh, you know, uniforms that are worn in hospitals, etc. It's not the person um, that should be recognized, it's the actual authority um, itself. So it can be purposeful. And I know there's a debate, for example, um, within lawyers about whether or not they be, should be wearing these wigs or not. Are they a bit silly or do they have a purpose? Um, but from perceptual terms, the point is that you don't recognize the person. Um, if uh, You find it more difficult to recognize the person um, if everyone is dressed in the same uh, in the same disguise subsequently okay okay we better not forget the animal the uh, plant kingdom along with the animal kingdom because even some plants are liars and some of those lies are quite entertaining um, so this is a um, passion flower um, and a passion flower has a problem because it gets attacked by um, a particular type of butterfly called the Heliconius butterfly. Um, an example of Heliconius is up there. Um, and the way it's attacked is that the butterfly uh, females lay their eggs on the leaves of uh, passionflower plants. Um, but a butterfly female has a problem because she has to be the first um, person to lay on that, or first butterfly to lay on that egg, on that leaf, because um, this is what's going to happen to the leaf as soon as the caterpillar hatches, he's going to um, eat the leaf, but he's also going to eat any other eggs that are there. So you have to be the first um, egg there, or you're going to end up dying. So a female has to look around for leaves that don't have any other eggs on. The passion flower has used this because what it does is it sneakily puts false eggs all over its leaves um, so that the butterfly will come along, think, oh no, that one, the leaf's been used, and go and look for a different one, um, and therefore this plant will get away with it. The um, passion flower has got another uh, little trick up its sleeve as well, because the butterfly recognizes the right species to lay on by the shape of the leaf. And so passion flowers have invented lots of different shapes of leaf, so that again, hopefully the butterfly will just think, oh, I don't know what this is, I'm going to go and look for the proper le um, leaf shape. So plants can be liars too. But deceit in the animal kingdom can get quite nasty at times. Um, the, a nice example of that is fireflies. 
Um, firefly mates, sorry, fire, firefly males will sit there flashing, and they flash a particular frequency um, for, um, it, for a given species. So the female is looking around for somebody that's flashing nice and brightly, because that means he's a big hunky male, but the right frequency for her species. When she sees someone doing it and thinks he's OK, then she'll go over somewhere else, and she'll sit down and she'll start flashing too. And he can see that she's accepted him, and he'll fly over to mate her which is absolutely fine unless it's an evil predatory firefly who's, uh, instead of being a female of, the, of the, that species, he just mimics the female of that species, flashes the same frequency, calls the male over, and the male comes over and gets eaten immediately. So um, deceit can be quite uh, unpleasant uh, in some examples. Pitcher plants are just as nasty. Um, they, uh, this is a pitcher plant that has a kind of flagon, and in the bottom of the flagon is some digestive juices. They need to, do, they need to eat insects because they're living in, a, in an area where the soil is very poor um, and doesn't have enough nutrients in it, so they need to supplement their nutrients by eating insects. Um, so what it needs to do is attract a fly. And to attract the fly, it does basically two things. It's the right color to appear to be a piece of rotting meat, um, and it also emits the smell of rotting meat. So a fly that's going past will smell the smell, home in on the uh, pitcher plant, and then as soon as it uh, gets close enough, it'll see this nice red um, circle that's just the right color for meat. Um, it'll go towards it, and they, that edge is very slippery, and it'll slip inside and start getting digested. As you can see, a, a little cricket has done there. So um, there are some uh, nasty things going on. There's also some really clever things going on. This is a, a particular butterfly called an Al Alcon Blue, the guy at the top. Um, and they hoodwink ants into looking after them. Incredibly, um, as larvae, they, they um, hatch out of their egg and they jump onto the ground and they just sit there and wait for an ant to find them. And normally, if an ant finds a caterpillar, it'll simply eat it um, or tear it to pieces and take it back to its um, larvae in, in bits. But the Alson blue butterfly larva emits the smell and the sound of an ant baby. Now, incredibly, ant babies do make a sound. I don't know what it sounds like, but it presumably is a little uh, scritchy noise. But they, they sit there emitting the right smell and the right sound to convince the ants that, in fact, this is one of their larvae that's got outside somehow. Um, and so the, the ant picks him up, so you can see in the middle picture, um, walks back into the nest with him, um, and sits there, or um, spends the next uh, few weeks, looking after it, feeding it, cleaning it, um, caring for it as if it was one of their own. Um, until they pupate, and they pupate um, under the ground, and then they come out as a butterfly, and the whole cycle begins again. So um, really clever um, uh, cheating going on in uh, butterflies. OK, and then we pass on to uh, <laughs> naughty bits of humans. <laughs> So the idea of getting somebody else to look after your offspring, and this is called uh, cuckoldry in humans. And the question is, does it exist? Um, and uh, there has been a lot of interest recently in the idea of misattributed paternity. And that is the um, presumed biological father of a patient or participant um, is discovered not to be the father. And there are lots of scary stories out there about prevalence being very, very high of misattributed paternity, but it's mainly fake news. Um, so, for example, when I did a quick uh, website search uh, to see, you know, to what are the uh, rates of uh, misattributed paternity, you get scary numbers like 30%, etc. Or, or and the one that most people settle on is that one in ten. Now, it's just not possible. Um, so, uh, but uh, studies that try to use as much as possible an unbiased sample tend to come up with rates of 0.8% to 3%. And even still, that's re really pretty high. Um, when you think about eight in every thousand babies is born to uh, a dad that, doesn't, that isn't the biological dad. Um, and, but it's all to do with the sample that's tested. So if you're looking at these studies yourself, just ask yourself, to what extent are these um, 
biased or unbiased um, samples. And there are um, very few studies that look at a truly unbiased, fully representative sample of the population um, uh, for rates of misattributed paternity. In this study here, uh, for example, they looked at uh, estimates of misattributed paternity um, depending on the confidence of the father that he is actually the biological father. So when the, when the father is confident that they are the biological father, then in that sample of men, then the rates of misattributed uh, paternity is very low. It's about, it's about one or two percent. Um, and, uh, but if you go then to the right-hand side of this plot here, these are fathers who have a very low confidence that they are the actual biological father of the, of the children that they're looking after. And in those incidences, so these would be samples, for example, that would go for DNA um, paternity tests for whatever reason, through court orders, etc. Um, in that sample, then, about one in three of those fathers tend, uh, turn out to be not the um, biological father of their, of their children. So it all depends on the sample. And as I said, there is very little um, done with a fully representative, unbiased samples. So taking a... Maybe we'll do it here afterwards. We'll just take a random <laughs> sample um, afterwards, because you're fully unbiased, right? Um, but there are very few... Most, most studies that have looked at this this type of uh, these types of rates use samples that have a motivation for knowing um, the uh, the outcome at least anyway. Okay. Um, naughty stuffs going on in the birds as well. Well, most of the animals really. Um, I've called this duplicitous dunnocks. Dunnock is this little bird up the top there. Very common um, in all your gardens probably, but you won't really notice it because it sneaks around in the undergrowth. It's quite hard to uh, spot. Um, it's also called a hedge sparrow. Um, but many of our supposedly monogamous species of birds, like blue tits and great tits and all the things in your garden, um, turn out to be anything but monogamous. They're actually lying and cheating the whole time. Um, Dunnocks are particularly interesting, um, which is why I picked them out, um, because there's basically lots of shenanigans going on. Um, it, uh, if you uh, look at this diagram, the dotted line means the male territory, and the solid line means the female territory. And the numbers are how many babies they're getting. So the uh, male really wants to be working in what's called polygyny. He wants to be working with a big territory and manage to have enough territory that he gets two females into it. Um, that's what he'd really like, because he's going to get the most kids that way. The female, on the other hand, so he's going to try and get a second female into his area, and the, this female is going to try and drive her out. The female, on the other hand, actually what she would like is to have all the, um, the parental care from this male, but she'd like to sneak another male into the system as well, have a little mating with him so that some of the kids are his, and get him to help with the nest too. Um, and that's called polyandry, and it's on the other side, um, represented that way. Um, so both of them um, are wanting something different from each other. They're wanting a second of the opposite sex, really, to help with the kids. And that's going to give them their best payoff. Who wins, who ends up, um, or what, what the mating relationship ends up as, depends on the skill of each individual in driving out rivals, basically. So if the female's very good at seeing off other females, then she's going to end up with a male all to herself. And if she's really lucky, she'll also get a beta male. If the male is really good at driving out rivals, um, then he's going to get the female all to himself and get rid of the beta male. Um, so they'll end up in monogamy. But um, all three of those different mating strategies exist in your garden and in my garden, um, because it depends on how good each, each individual is at um, cheating and lying. Red-winged blackbirds, which is this nice uh, bird up there, uh, exists in America, not here, um, but they're so busy mating with the neighbors um, and, in fact, doing another game which is called egg dumping, where the female goes next door, lays an egg in somebody else's nest and leave it, leaves that there for them to raise, goes back to her own nest and raises as many as she can. Um, egg dumping and these um, what's called uh, extra pair fertilizations, so going elsewhere and mating with somebody else, is going on so much that you see this pattern. Now, this diagram, each of these big circles um, is a territory, and the numbers are the, the uh, bottom number um, is how many eggs or how many young are in the nest, 
and the top number of the, of the fraction is how many are actually related to the male, this, this diagram is for the males, are related to the male who thinks he's the father, who's looking after that nest. Um, and what you find is that there's all sorts of stuff going on. Oh, in the circles, the, uh, the arrow with a circle is um, how many offspring have been put into somebody else's nest, either by egg dumping or by mating with the neighbor. Um, so you see the, the guy that's uh, um, singled out here, he's raised three, um, and the ones in his nest are actually his, but he's in fact had seven chicks because he's dumped two on the neighbor below and two on the neighbor above. The guy at the top there, A, has raised none at all. He's having a really uh, a restful time, but he's had seven kids because he's dumped them next door and down below and way over here. Um, and there's always got to be a dupe in the system. Um, the guy that's now indicated the naught over four, he's got four kids, he's raising four kids, but none of them are actually his. Um, so he's been uh, dumped on big time. Fairy wrens are doing this to such an extreme that they get called gonads on wings um, <laughs> because they actually are, on average, not related to the kids they're raising at all. Um, so it's not 0.8 so like humans or 3% uh, like humans, it's 0%. <laughs> they are no, not related at all to the kids that they're raising because they've done so much throwing their eggs around. This kind of thing didn't, we were totally unaware of this until genetic testing started happening and people started actually looking at who was related to who. Another kind of cheating system in this whole mating game um, are, is have to be undertaken by small males, because up till now we've said, you know, the big male, the best male, he gets the, the mate, he can hold the territory and so on. And that's how it is. But what does a small male do about it? Well, a nice example of what, what uh, one of the most common things that they do about it is shown in this animal. It's the Australian giant cuttlefish. Um, they come together in, in groups of hundreds um, on the Great Barrier Reef, and um, each big male gets a nice territory, and he sits there um, on his territory and he attracts the females. Females say, oh yeah, he's got a nice territory, he's a nice lad, I'll have him. And they come up and they put on particular mating colours. Um, and those mating colours are saying to the male, yes, I'll, I'll accept you. And then he lifts up his skirts a bit and she sits underneath and he puts her skirts back down over her so that nobody else can steal her. So far, so good. If you're a, um, a sneaking male, then what can you do? Well, what you can do is put on the colours of a female, come up boldly to a male saying, oh yeah, I'll have you, don't you worry. Um, and he'll lift up his skirts and, he'll, and the um, sneaker male will go underneath and mate with the female that the guy's already got <laughs> quick while he's not looking um, and then run for it before he uh, spots it. So um, the, the uh, big male is duped completely because the uh, sneaky male um, has effectively hidden as a female um, and got accepted as the second female and done his evil way. So uh, lots of interesting things are going on in the animal kingdom in this uh, way. So the shenanigans happening in the garden and in the seas around us, what about in our own homes? What are humans up to? Well, if you look at any popular media and you look at prevalence or rates of infidelity, for example, uh, amongst humans, you'll be kind of shocked, I think. Um, and so, for example, this is just one example from popular media of rates across uh, Europe. They didn't ask us in Ireland. I don't know why. Maybe we didn't understand the question, which is, have you ever been unfaithful in, uh, whilst you were uh, at the same time in a steady relationship? And if you look at some of these rates, I mean, for example, 55% of French men said yes. 33% um, of French women said yes. 50% uh, of Spanish men said yes. And 28% of Spanish women said yes. And the same with the Italians. But apparently the, the worst is, uh, are people from Thailand. And uh, sorry to anybody who's in Thailand. Uh, uh, um, so, but, so these rates are, are kind of scary um, because it suggests that half of the men in the European population are up to no good, um, whereas a lot of the women, uh, a third at least, uh, are, are also up to um, no good. But um, rates of infidelity have been around for a long time, and ever since the Kinsey reports in the 1950s, um, 
The similar rates have been bandied around that about half of uh, men in the population um, and a quarter of women studied had committed um, uh, adultery. But if you think about it, something's wrong. The maths don't add up, right? Uh, either men are exaggerating or women are lying, or women are twice as busy with each guy that they're <laughs> with the guys in the population, or something is not adding up. Um, and you might think, well, why, uh, why would uh, females not exaggerate, and why might men do? And there might be other different reasons for that. Um, but in terms of the science behind this, it turns out that if you apply a particular methodology, then you're going to get a biased answer. And that methodology is a forced choice. So if you ask your participants, have you uh, cheated uh, in your, whilst you were in a steady relationship, yes or no, then you get those types of results that I just said, 50% of men and, and a quarter of, of women. However, if you apply um, different types of methodology, a lot, much more subtle approach, um, so uh, ratings, etc., then uh, the results are much more equal. Um, so you don't get these massive sex differences um, between men and um, women. They're much more um, uh, egalitarian, I guess, in, in one way. Um, and also, those uh, rates, 50% of men and a quarter of, of women, they don't fit with what we know about um, human behavior. So, for example, that sexual jealousy motivates men to committing uh, domestic abuse and murder mu much more um, often than women. Maybe that's a reason why women uh, don't want to tell people that they've been unfaithful um, as well. Um, but these are interesting because they they have nice parallels with what's going on in the um, in the uh, amongst with the sparrows in the in the in the garden. But why do females want to cheat? Surely, if they've got the best male, they want to keep the best male and should live happily ever after. Um, but actually, there's more going on than that. Um, and this picture indicates one of the problems, which is that. Um, if there's any other males around, they're going to kill the kids, basically. Because if, they're, if for instance, in a, um, a lion, there's a coalition, um, the, the male that's getting the matings is happy with the kid, that the kids are his, but the other males will want to get rid of those kids so that they can get a chance at having children. So infanticide is a real problem for women. And one of the ways you can get around that um, is to mate with everybody, um, and then nobody knows which kids are his, um, and so therefore he's much less likely to uh, uh, kill them. Some species have really clever biology to let them do that. Um, and one of those examples is the badger, um, which I, I work on. Um, female badgers have a really bizarre mating system because they produce, a, they, they mate, and get a fertile egg, but they don't implant that egg. They just leave it floating around in the uterus um, for a while. Um, and they actually let, leave it for the whole year. So they, they, mate in, um, they begin mating in February, and they won't implant it until the beginning of the next uh, winter. So um, they hold it for the whole of the spring, autumn, spring, summer, and autumn. During that time, they have another very clever specialization, which is that they can produce more eggs and get um, those fertilized as well. And so they can actually collect up eggs um, over the course of the year. And they can, of course, mate with their, mate, their, their male all they like, but they can also go next door and mate with Harry and down the road with Fred and along the um, corridor with George and so on. And they can collect up matings from everyone. Um, and just collect up these eggs in their uterus, then when they come to um, implant them, then the dominant knows he's had some um, uh, matings, so he knows some of the cubs are his, but he's no idea which. Um, and any other male that comes past probably also mated her at some point, so they've no idea which is, is theirs. So the female ends up with a nice variety of different cubs from a nice variety of different fathers, um, and no danger of anybody killing any of them. Um, so it's very clever biology that leads to what we actually see um, in the badgers. Chickens, you think chickens were kind of boring and you wouldn't be interested in them at all, but chickens have fantastic stories too. And one of them um, is their way to cheat. Um, you all know a, a, a cockerel is a boisterous little animal and it uh, drives everybody mad by his crowing and showing off. Um, chickens are really quite exuberant males. 
And the females have a problem with that because he's going to try and mate her, and if she doesn't want him because he's actually rather a wimp, she's going to um, have a real problem because he's going to follow her around trying to mate all the time. And he'll carry on doing that, attracting predators and causing her hassle forever. So her answer to that is just to give in. Basically, she accepts a, um, a mating from him, even though she, he's not got the genes that she actually wants. And she's also probably uh, mating with the best guy in the, in the uh, farmyard as well. But she's now been mated by this imbecile. Um, what's she going to do? Well, what she actually does is she sneaks behind a rock, waits till he goes away and leaves her alone because he's done his mating now, sneaks behind a rock and emits the sperm <laughs> so that she doesn't get fertilized by him at all. So when the chicks um, uh, come along, she's accepted the sperm um, physically into her... her uh, um, well, f uh, fertilization areas, because they're not all named the same thing, cloaca... Um, uh, from the dominant male, from the best one, the one that she actually wanted matings from, but she's emitted and, and chucked out all the sperm from the guys that she really didn't want. So just to ask the same question about humans, why would human females want to cheat? And there are different theories put out there as to why they would. Um, and the assumption for a, for a long time in the literature was that uh, males uh, cheat because they want to um, improve their... Um, uh, they want to have as many gene um, offspring as possible, whereas women cheat because they want to get more carers uh, to help look after the uh, offspring, very much like the animal kingdom. And for a long time, surveys were um, consistent with that idea that um, males were more upset uh, when they heard about uh, their female partner's uh, sexual infidelity, um, whereas females were more upset when they heard about their male partner's um, emotional infidelity. Um, and that fitted that nice idea then that uh, um, men want to have as many offspring as, as possible and women ne need caring and loving. Um, but there was a failure to replicate those studies, um, and those studies came from a time, uh, from an era, I would say, in which um, women uh, were not as independent as men, so it might have been different motivations that would have led them to feel more upset about a male's infidelity, um, simply because they were so dependent on them in many different ways. And if we look at that research and we modernize it and we ask the same questions today that were asked maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we get a different story um, and a very interesting story. Um, um, because, and, and the other thing that, to, to, um, that the older research didn't include was any type of um, questions that would be uh, directed at homosexuals where um, issues of offspring, for example, wouldn't necessarily, or at least biological offspring, wouldn't necessarily hold. Um, so uh, in this more recent study here that I've shown you the results of, they asked uh, people here, to what would be more, uh, what, what would you focus more on if your partner uh, committed adultery? Um, and uh, would you be more upset about the emotional aspect of it, or would you be more upset about the sexual aspect of it? And consistently across the board, whether you're male or female, whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, um, it was the emotional aspect that was more upsetting than the actual, um, the sexual act itself, the sexual infidelity itself. Um, so, uh, so modern research is telling us something a lot more um, nuanced than um, the research that was maybe conducted a few years ago um, uh, didn't manage to capture. Um, and that is that there are very little sex differences when it comes to um, our attitudes to, uh, to infidelity, etc. Um, and what about uh, power? So a bit like the chicken story, uh, you know, you want to make sure that uh, you're, uh, you're attracting uh, the dominant uh, partner. Um, and uh, for a long time, it was thought that that was really the um, exclusive domain of male um, humans. Um, but more recently, it turns out, and especially in this study here, um, that in a survey of about 1,500 um, individuals, the results show that elevated power is positively associated with infidelity for both men and women. Um, so, and, and what's mediating that is that power gives you the confidence to attract more partners. 
Um, and there was no difference, which is really interesting, is no difference between men and women in, um, in this result, which goes against what um, evolutionary psychologists would have um, claimed for um, a very long time. And the relationship between uh, you know, power and, uh, um, and infidelity is very strong, um, as shown in these two rather complicated um, drawings. But, but, uh, but what's interesting, though, is that it is mediated uh, by confidence. It's probably what they didn't test in this study was opportunity as well. If you are in a position of power, you are more likely to meet more people as well, and maybe the opportunities present to you. But it's, um, so they were just interested, though, in um, attitudes um, in this study. But I think it's very interesting that um, the more we look into human behavior, the less um, evidence we have that there is any difference between um, the sexes that was thought that, that were, was thought to be uh, vast differences for a very long time, but it turns out to be not really the case. Thank you. What animals are saying to each other is also turns out not to be trustworthy. Um, so all of this uh, cheating kind of behind, below the radar dar is going on, but also when they're um, uh, singing, they're not actually necessarily portraying what's really there. Um, so birds sing to attract their mates um, and to defend their territories. But a lot of animals, a lot of birds will, will increase their repertoire, so increase the number of different songs they can sing simply by mimicking things in their environment. And there's lots of arguments about why they might do that. Um, but starlings, for instance, if you listen to starlings um, and the... the um, uh, machine out there is trying to be, be a starling, but it's trying to be a starling just copying a, a car alarm, which is why it doesn't sound very starling-like, because actually a starling will copy lots and lots of different things it's in, in its environment, and it'll intersperse them with um, crackling. So you get a car alarm, but then you'll get a mobile phone, and then you'll get a, a different bird, and so on, with starling crackles in between. So what they're saying isn't necessarily um, being accurate about what, they're, what they are. The most impressive example of this is the lyrebird, um, which can mimic uh, incredible um, sounds. So rather than trying to describe this, I'll just let you listen to it. Um, so if our technician can uh, turn on our um, first uh, recording, then I'll let you listen to what's going on. It's just gone away. So, yes. What bird has the most elaborate, the most complex? Yes, there are lots of contenders, but this bird must be one of them. The superb lyrebird of South Australia. He clears a space in the forest to serve as his concert platform. To persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is fooled. <laughs> <laughs> he can imitate the calls of at least 20 different species. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby.
That's coming from the bird, that sound. <laughs> So I just find them completely astonishing that they can make a sound of it, 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 that's so unlike a bird sound, um, and so accurately. So, okay, can humans do the same? Yes, they can. <laughs> Beat that. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, our brain, uh, the voices are very important to humans, um, and in particular because voices are a very, uh, are a unique signature to our own identity. Um, and it turns out there's a region in our brain that is dedicated to recognizing other people's voices, irrespective of what they say. And that's highlighted there in, uh, in red um, in, the, in the diagram up there. Um, and uh, so, so we have, so our brain is wired up to recognize different voices, but it's also wired up to recognize different states and different traits of voices. Um, so for example, our voice can, oops, our voice can change, uh, let me go back, yeah. Yes. Um, our uh, voice can change depending on our emotional state, whether we're happy or whether we're angry or sad. Um, and uh, there are sex differences in voices, so men have a lower pitch voice than, uh, than females, and if we exaggerate that, uh, um, we get very clear uh, recognition that that's a male voice, that's a female voice. Um, and your voice will modulate as well within interactions as well as um, between interactions. So um, as just as a, a, um, a very personal a example, my son is sitting here in the audience and the last time he um, sat in on one of my lectures, he said to me afterwards, why did you use that funny voice when you were talking? <laughs> That's my teaching voice. I don't talk to my son at home like this. <laughs> um, so we use our voice for different contexts, different occasions, and um, to enhance uh, our meaning as well, we can change and modulate um, our voice. And our repertoire of how we can use our voices is really in incredible. Um, uh, even those of us who, who can't mimic uh, voices, it's still in uh, the range is still incredible. And the fact that our brain can still pick out the identity of different individuals, given the range of changes that a voice can, uh, that a single voice and multiple voices can undergo, is um, is something that us scientists are trying to understand um, how the brain does that. But just to give you an insight just like the lyrebird that Nicola showed, um, as to you know, the range of which um, the human voice can go. If it, you could just think of an opera singer, for example, or an alto singer. But I want to give you an example here of um, how recent technology can show us how different types of voices can be generated. Um, and in this video here that I'm going to show you, this is um, a video of a chap that can do beatbox. And you can now image um, a, the inside of the mouth and the tongue and how it moves um, when they're generating these different sounds. So I'll just let you listen to this for a second. He takes a bit of a swallow at the end there, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so we can we can now put people into the um, uh, MRI scanner and image in real time how they can produce these um, sounds. So we get a much better understanding of the link between the brain and our vocal reactions. So you can get rid of the, yeah. Uh, sorry, it isn't I, up there. Oh, it's not there anymore. Oh, sorry. It's only um, Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, and, uh, and just like our faces, um, we can make judgments about how attractive another person's voice is. So that lyre bird was trying to attract a mate. Um, and there are cues within voices that we can also pick up that we will prefer um, uh, over other cues. Um, so for ex and, and also, just like in faces, um, those vocal cues um, can be affected biological, by 
biological factors such as changes in hormones um, throughout the menstrual cycle. So for example, a female's voice sounds most attractive at that time of the menstrual cycle when conception is at risk and least attractive outside of that time. Um, and, uh, but this doesn't work, by the way, just to, it, uh, same with faces, it doesn't work for um, women who are taking um, uh, hormonal contraception, nor does it work for postmenopausal um, women either. So it seems to be related to fertility and uh, attractiveness. Um, Again, just like faces, if you average a person's voice, um, you can do that using computer algorithms, the average voice is te tends to be uh, perceived as more attractive than um, any of the individual component vocal voice clips that went into making that um, average. Um, and low pitch in, in male voices um, is associated with uh, dominance. Um, and uh, so, and again, low pitch and dominance affects judgments of attractiveness, and just like in faces, um, it can also affect um, other types of behavior, such as who you decide to choose um, as your uh, political leaders, uh, um, etc. But it can also make you yourself decide what voice should I use if I'm doing, say, for example, a business deal. Uh, we tend to lower the pitch of our voice if we're trying to convince somebody else to um, do business uh, with us. Um, so, and that works for, uh, that, that it, we think that that works just for uh, uh, the same with men as it does uh, for women. Okay, um, so this whole business can get quite complicated and um, the, my next example is, is just, um, again, David Attenborough helping you, I think it's David Attenborough helping you this time, to understand just how tricky um, animals can be and how clever they can be, be about um, tricking their friends. So I'll just let it explain itself as you go. The Dronco is the Kalahari's greatest trickster. And these are his victims. A family of meerkats, desert specialists. After warming up in the morning sun, the meerkats begin their search for breakfast. Drongo can now begin his tricks. But he must first win the confidence of his victims. He spots an eagle on the hunt and sounds a warning. One that sends the meerkats gratefully scurrying to safety. Danger over. And now he has their trust. He sounds another warning. But this time it's a false alarm. Thank you very much. The meerkats fell for it. Seems too easy. He tries the same trick again. But the meerkats aren't stupid. They'll only fall for it once. The juicy scorpion won't be for him. <laughs> then, suddenly, the sound of a sentry's warning. No mere cat can ignore that. Sentries never lie. But the sentry sees no danger. <laughs> Guess who? the drum girl. He's learned to mimic the meerkat's own warning call. And 
Now he can enjoy his prize. A gang of meerkats outsmarted by a bird. Until that sound goes right. <laughs> so, um, can I go back to my... Um, yes, so the drongos um, are cheating, and they're learning to cheat more effectively. I want you to think a little bit about how intentional that is. is the, has the drongo simply learned that if it gives random um, alarm calls and not too close together, then it'll get dinner? Or is he thinking it through and thinking, I know, I'll dupe the meerkats? And we'll come back to that right at the end. Mm -hmm. I have one more uh, little clip that I think you should um, see, which is about the best cheat and liar in the animal kingdom that we've come across yet, which is the mimic octopus. Um, and again, I, I want you, while you're, thinking, while you're watching this, to think a little bit about how intentional it is. Is the animal simply learned that, that uh, cause and effect, or has he um, learned to think about um, what to mimic? Unknown until it was spotted, first by fishermen off the coast of Indonesia in the 1990s. It looked like an octopus, but it could morph its shape in an instant to appear as seemingly any animal around it. At first, no one had any idea what it was. The first time I saw it, I just was blown away. You couldn't get a more spectacular animal. It really is the pinnacle of wizardry. Biologist Mark Norman was the first scientist to study this seemingly shapeless creature. He named it the Mimic Octopus. The Mimic Octopus makes itself look like a living, moving animal. So it pulls all its arms around behind its body and swims along like a poisonous flatfish called a banded sole. In other cases, if it's getting attacked, it puts six arms down a hole and raises the other two arms to look like a poisonous sea snake that has bands along its body. If that's not enough, it'll swim along looking like a poisonous lionfish with these banded arms looking like the banded spines that come off these very deadly fish. So far, 15 separate species are known to be in the Mimic Octopus Act and Norman is not always sure exactly what the Mimic is doing. He that observed the this Mimic scuttling along the sea bottom, looking something like a furry turkey with human legs. Sometimes it's hard when you watch a Mimic octopus doing what it does to interpret what's going on. It's a bit like looking at ink spots in a psychiatrist's office going, uh, I don't know what that is, it could be a piano, it could be a fridge. So you get three or four divers together and you'll argue all night trying to work out what we think it was mimicking. Where did nature's greatest actor come from? We'll have to leave that mystery to, uh, <laughs> to think about. But, uh, but yeah, to what extent is the, uh, are either the, the uh, drongo or the mimic octopus really understanding what they're doing? And to what extent are they simply um, learning that they, they survive if they do these things? Which, um, and, and, and to add to that as well, if, if we're surrounded by um, uh, behavior of others that's out to dupe us or to deceive us in some way, just like the, the meerkats, how well can we learn um, from that information um, not to trust uh, somebody else? Um, and so there's a lot of research in cognitive neuroscience on what is it about other people's faces, expressions, etc., that we would perceive instantly as trustworthy in that, fa in, in that face. Um, and we can perceive, it turns out, we can perceive trustworthiness very reliably within the first 100 millisecond exposure to a new face. Um, if we make a judgment about whether that person is trustworthy or not, that tends to be correct and reliable, and it, it tends not to change even if you've been given a longer exposure to that face. And, and moreover, there is a region in the brain called the amygdala, which um, is considered that region of the brain that uh, responds to uh, fear, for example. That region is seen as being active when you present participants with faces that were previously rated as being untrustworthy. 
Um, even if the participant is doing a random task, I just judge what age that face is, for example. The amygdala lights up when the face um, is of a face of somebody that somebody else thinks is untrustworthy. Um, which is really interesting, because it, it suggests then that we've got a brain that's wired up to help us detect cheaters and people who are out to get us. Um, and also, the information can also be in, in that other person's face. And, and what is that? What, are, what have dis, uh, scientists discovered about what it is that we use as a cue um, to tell us whether or not a face is trustworthy or not? And it turns out to be the width to height ratio of a face. So the, in basic terms, the wider the face, the less trustworthy we, we perceive that um, face. And if you put um, a bunch of guys into um, a scenario um, and they, where they have to play a game and they, um, they could cheat if they wanted to, it's the guys with the wider faces that tend to end up cheating um, than the guys with the longer, thinner um, faces. Every guy in the audience now is thinking, how wide is my face, I wonder? <laughs> And even if you, um, using clever computer graphics, it, you can manipulate um, that width to height ratio in a face and ask people then, uh, you just random sample of participants to make judgments of trustworthiness in a, in a rating scale to each of these faces that are unfamiliar to them. What you'll get is that the faces that have been manipulated as being wider um, are rated as being least trustworthy than exactly the same identity, but uh, with a thinner face. So we have cues from the environment that helps us to understand whether or not um, uh, you can trust that other individual, so we can learn um, from what's around us. We can also take facial expressions and decide whether or not um, it, what that person is expressing is sincere or not, and that sort of research has been going on for hundreds of years, ever since a chap called Duchenne tried to measure the muscular movements that were involved in a genuine smile versus a fake smile. Um, but it turns out we're really good at detecting um, fake from uh, real smiles, especially um, when faces move. Not so good if it's just a photograph of a face, but when the, as soon as the face moves, we can detect instantly that's a fake smile. So we I think we have, we, to, yeah, we have to wrap it up now. And um, so we've given you very sort of whistle top stop tour of the animal kingdom and human animal um, behavior as well. Um, and what we've tried to impress upon you is that both humans and animals are deceivers. But I think what we both think what the really interesting question is, um, to what extent is, um, is this behavior intentional um, uh, in humans as well as in animals? Um, and I think we'll probably just leave you uh, with that thought uh, rather than providing you with any answers at this stage. That's for another lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, in a world of fake news, I think it's uh, really interesting to see how uh, fakery and uh, mimicry exists in the animal kingdom and almost is uh, almost re rehabilitated as, <laughs> as a word, uh, with thanks to you two. We're going to open up to the floor really quickly if anyone has any questions. We can't see if anyone has any questions. Yeah, just, the lines come right to the so. front, then. Yeah. <laughs> or any thoughts about intentionalness and not intentionalness? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the passion plant, is it, or something passion like that? Passion flower, yeah. yeah. Uh, so over what evolutionary period did, did this take place, basically? Was it no like idea. that from the start? <laughs> we don't know. Um, <laughs> I've no idea, I'm afraid, but uh, I, um, I mean, it will have taken millions of years. Um, but what would you say? Say that again? I say, I say it's the evolution the, the happening since the Big Bang. Well, it's been happening since the Big Bang, but how long, how long since the passion flower didn't have um, false eggs on its leaves? Don't know, I'm afraid. So these things take millions of years, but... Uh. So what might the motivation of the lyre bird be to mimic a chainsaw? if it wasn't mindless mimicry? Yeah, um, it's a very good question why animals have, why they do this gaining of a repertoire by copying all the sounds around them. But um, it's not really clear why it works. 
Um, but the, there is evidence that a territory is held better by a repertoire of songs than by a single song sung a lot of times. So they've taken so you can it, it, it's more effective at getting the territory um, or holding on to the territory. So it may just be that that he's simply very good at copying lots of different sounds, and it's a way of collecting lots of different sounds and getting a big repertoire. If the animal falls um, on other, uh, the, another animal, would the animal that was fooled, would uh, it trust them again? Well, that's a very good question. And, it, and the meerkats, it didn't. They, they knew to, to... But meerkats are very clever, you see. They knew to not trust the, the drongo the second time. Um, and the drongo had to change his trick a little bit, didn't he? It's hard to know um, for, for other animals, for animals that aren't quite so clever, how many times they can get um, fooled, but they will eventually learn. So all of these things are, we call it density dependent, you have to, or frequency dependent, you, you can't do it lots and lots of times. So it's the same as crying wolf. You can't cry wolf lots of times because everybody will know you're cheating. Um, but you can do it a couple of times. And if you do it and then are very honest for a while and then do it again, you get away with it. Julie <laughs> <Truly> noted. <laughs> I'll teach your son to cheat, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can. I might just get the mic over to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I did some research myself into bird song, and I discovered that uh, in general, birds, they, they use at the pentatonic scale. You know the pentatonic scale? All right, yeah. Five, um, and they still manage to get a great diversity of sound and musical uh, levels on it. Mm -hmm. But I saw one, one particular um, person went and he started to jam with some birds in an aviary with a, a clarinet. Uh -huh. And they started to... To, to respond to back. To group together, yeah, which is quite a marvel. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, there was a, another bit of research was done and it showed that birds actually enjoy singing. Like, you know, the amygdala mm -hmm. shows displeasure or whatever. And it showed that the... the um, like endor they have a discharge of endorphins, like, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's endorphins, but they could see that the bird was actually brought the happiness. Yeah, it could well be endorphins, that that's one of the things. or territorial, they have fun. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, but the, the, the whole question about why is it fun, they've evolved to like it because it's, it's adaptively useful. Mm. So, I mean, it, so it's not actually that they do it for fun well, entirely, because that's not the end of the story, the because they do it for fun because they've evolved to find it fun yeah. because it's very good for their survival. Yeah, that's true. So it's, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, um, I don't know about the pentatonic scale bit, but the, um, the jamming with a, with a bird... Mm. Um, birds have a particular type, well, some species of birds have a particular type of um, uh, competition that they have um, where they're, they're fighting for ownership of a territory in which one bird sings song A and the other bird has to sing song B and then so the first one has to sing song C and so on. They have to, have to have enough of their repertoire, which is another reason why they might want a repertoire. Um, they have to have enough of a repertoire that they can sing a different song in response to each song that's sung. So they may well have been doing that with your friend, um, that they, you know, he's playing a song, so I better sing a different one back, um, and so on, so that they, can, they, they think he's competing for their territory. Yeah, they can improvise too, it seems. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> one question, and it goes back to um, spotting a fake with this new craze in Photoshop and filters and everything like that on on uh, photos, does that like do people start to look beyond the filter, or or is that still uh, is that something that you guys look at at all? Yeah, how good are humans at identifying a fake in, uh, in wow. that uh, kind of world? Is that too big a question? <laughs> it's it's a really interesting question, and. Uh, um, I, I think different disciplines have a different answer to that. I, I know, that, uh, for example, a Jackson Pollock was identified as being a fake simply because of the fractal information that was in it. So a physicist uh, identified it as being a fake. Um, there's 
massive market in fake things, isn't there? Fake handbags and things like that. And, and I'm interested in handbags. Um, I'm interested for two reasons. One, because I like them. But secondly, because I'm interested in why would we go out and spend 1,000 euro of our hard-earned cash to buy a handbag when a supermarket shopping bag has exactly the same functionality and costs 20 cents? Um, and uh, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think that if you, when you, what we're discovering in our research is if you become an expertise at something, at something, an expert at something, let's say you really know your Gucci handbags, you'll spot a fake a mile away. Um, if you know your cars, it's exactly the same. If you know your cars, you'll know that uh, um, you'll know that um, that's not uh, the best model of that car, for example, or that that's not that's trying to. You'll know you'll recognise the cheaper models and what type of expensive model they're trying to mimic. Um, so it's to do with expertise, um, I think, and uh, we know that the brain can learn very rapidly and we know what regions of the brain that are involved in that type of expertise, and it's the same region of the brain that's involved in being able to recognise faces, because oh, faces yeah. are so similar to each other, um, a real and a fake handbag or a real and a fake piece of art are so similar to each other, you need to have the tools, the cognitive tools, to be able to identify the differences. So expertise and cognitive expertise is a real big area of interest to neuroscientists at the moment. Uh, that doesn't even answer your question, does it? I'm close. <laughs> it's getting there. <laughs> I think we have one more and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, if the animal, oh. when it was camouflaged, would the same animal recognise it? <laughs> As in, can a camouflaged... Um, Would its kin uh, recognise? Uh, uh, oh, right. Can, can they spot each other? Yes. I've no idea. That is a really good, good <laughs> question. I've no idea whether they have trouble seeing each other or whether they can spot each other. Humans I would, can. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Humans... Are, I would guess that they're better than the average at spotting um, somebody who's camouflaged, but, but I really have no idea. That's really, I've, I've, I'll have to think of an experiment to test that, because I like that. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank Fiona and Nicola. I think they did a fantastic job exposing the fakery and uh, trickery that happens in the animal kingdom, not in just humans. Um, it's been really fascinating, and hopefully you'll join us for the next two lectures. Um, we have Dominic Milmo uh, Perry looking at forgery in the art world, both in Ireland and abroad. Mm -hmm. And then we have... Uh, Declan Fahi from DCU and Joe Roach from Trinity College looking at uh, scientific bullshit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.